The turn-based Mario games have received copious amounts of praise over the years, with games such as Super Mario RPG and Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga often being ranked among the best RPGs of all time. While plenty of these games certainly qualify as classics, many fans debate over which one is truly the best, with a very common choice being Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. This is largely due to that game's great gameplay mechanics, storyline, visual style, and of course, endearing characters. That made us wonder, as we often do, which members of this cast rank is the most ethical in which ones cross the line into downright deplorable. I'm Andrew with 1UP Binge, and this is Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door Characters Good to Evil. As usual, we'll be starting with the most noble character and working our way down to the most evil. So let's fly our paper airplanes into the good section. The gold medal of good is going to the main man himself, Mario. This should come as no surprise, as Mario is the protagonist of the game, and as such, the most committed, efficient, and dedicated character on this journey. Once Princess Peach is captured by the Exonauts, Mario sets out on a journey to rescue her as he's done so many times before. He travels from area to area, helping as many people as he can along the way. Whether their problems are significant significant or minor nuisances. Every character in the game has a high opinion of Mario. His allies see him as a noble hero, and his enemies see him as a very legitimate threat, both of which are very correct. Mario always thinks about the well-being of others first, and is willing to spring into action at a moment's notice to help those who he cares about. What else is there to really say? It's a him! Mario! The Silver Medal of Good is awarded to Koops. The second party member Mario encounters on his journey, Koops is a resident of Petalburg, whose father disappeared years ago, presumably killed by Hooktail the Dragon. When Mario heads off to Hooktail Castle, Koops requests to join the party to avenge his father's death. Koops is very shy and timid at first, but does prove to be quite heroic when he finally musters up enough courage. This is kind of a similar personality to another partner Mario often teams up with. What's his name? Oh yeah, Luigi. Koops is certainly one of the nicest characters in the game, even though he does anger his girlfriend when he decides to join Mario on his quest. We understand her concern, although we don't think going against her wishes makes Koops immoral, considering he's putting his own safety at risk for a good reason. The Bronze Medal of Good is awarded to Yoshi Kid, also known as Mini Yoshi, the Great Gonzalez Jr., or whatever the heck you want to call him since the player chooses his name. If it's all the same to you, we're going to call him Yoshi Kid. This baby Yoshi hatches from a mysterious egg that Mario finds in the Glitz Pit's back rooms. Upon his birth, Yoshi Kid immediately claims allegiance with Mario and helps him work his way up in the Glitz Pit ranks. Yoshi Kid is highly competitive, which makes sense given that he was born in a fighting arena. Despite being very in your face at times, Yoshi Kid is as good-hearted as any Yoshi and battles in the name of justice. Yoshi Kid is also, arguably, Mario's most useful companion in the game's overworld, as riding around on him greatly decreases the time it takes to travel to different areas. Even as a newborn infant, Yoshi Kid proves to have one one of the highest moral fibers out of anyone in the game. Bouncing into the next spot is Goombella. This is Mario's first partner in the game, who he saves from Lord Crump upon arriving in Rogueport. This causes Goombella to gain a lot of respect for Mario, and she agrees to help him on his quest to rescue Princess Peach. Goombella is highly intelligent and informative, being a second-year student at the University of Goom. She does have a tendency to be sassy toward other characters, especially toward sleazy Goomba enemies who try to hit on her. Never thought I'd say the phrase sleazy Goomba in my life. Even with her occasional sarcasm, Goombella is quite friendly and heroic, landing her a spot firmly in the good category. Sailing in next is Admiral Bobbery. Prior to the events of the game, Admiral Bobbery's wife had passed away while Bobbery was out sailing. This led him to blame himself for not being there to nurse his wife when she needed help. This caused the poor Babam to become depressed and jaded, refusing to help Mario navigate to Keel Hall Key. Once he receives a letter from his deceased wife, Admiral Bobbery reluctantly agrees to help Mario on his quest. While initially somewhat cold to Mario, we definitely don't hold this against Admiral Bobbery given his tragic backstory. Admiral Bobbery does warm up to Mario a lot as the adventure continues, leading him to really show his true heroism. Bobbery's wife Scarlet may not have been around to see it, but we're sure she would be proud that the good Admiral was able to move on while still honoring her memory. Man, these bob sure know how to get us oddly emotional. Next up is Professor Frankly. A previous teacher of Goombellas at the University of Goom, Professor Frankly asks for Mario's help in researching the legendary treasure of Rogueport. In order to do that, he takes Mario and Goombella to the Thousand Year Door, which Mario uses to find the location of the Crystal Stars. While Mario and friends are out on their quest, Professor Frankly stays
stays back and does further research on Rogueport, readying the party for their following course of action. Even if he isn't on the battlefield himself, Professor Frank Lee's role in the game is absolutely necessary in the game's story. He also teaches Mario action moves and receives emails from Princess Peach. Even if he usually only appears between chapters, Professor Frank Lee is a very important and well-intentioned part of this journey. Even though she's not that prominent throughout the game, we still gotta give a shout out to Toadette. While Toadette originally appeared as an unlockable character in Mario Kart Double Dash, her first significant role in a story-based game was in Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. Here, Toadette appears whenever Mario obtains a power-up to either his jumping or hammer attacks. She teaches Mario how to use said moves in a brief tutorial before he moves on to the next part of his adventure. We are ranking her slightly lower than some other characters since she's not out there helping Mario on the front lines, which she absolutely could be based on her later experiences in games such as New Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe. Still, Toadette is portrayed as sweet and helpful and even hints to having a small crush on Mario. She even runs away crying in her final appearance knowing it'll be the last time she and Mario will meet. If only someone could have told her that she was going to become one of the most prominent recurring Mario characters a few years down the line. Surprisingly, we are just now arriving at Princess Peach. At the beginning of the game, it is revealed that Peach has gone on vacation alone due to getting tired of Toadsworth always worrying about her well-being. The problem is that Toadsworth was absolutely justified as Peach ends up getting captured by the x knots the moment she arrives in Rogueport. After that lapse of judgment, Peach ends up in the x knots fortress where she teaches their computer Tech XX about love. It is later revealed that the reason she was captured is because she's pure of heart, making her the perfect vessel to be possessed by the Shadow Queen. Peach is certainly kind and wants to do her best to help, evident by the many emails she sends Mario as she learns more about Grotus' schemes. Despite being apparently pure at heart, we're ranking her a bit low as it was pretty silly and reckless to go walking around alone given her history of being captured. Heck, even when she has protection on vacation, she still gets captured like in Super Mario Sunshine, so there was no excuse for this. Not exactly a moral, but a pretty dumb move. Blowing her way into the next spot is Madame Fleury, a wind spirit who was once a famous actress. Madame Fleury now lives isolated in a luxurious home in Bogley Woods. When Mario first arrives, she won't leave her home due to losing her esteemed necklace, causing Mario to go retrieve it from the Shadow Sirens. Upon doing so, Madame Fleury joins Mario's quest to repay his kind act. This shows us that Madame Fleury definitely has a lot of loyalty, which is a very commendable trait. We rank her a bit lower than some other party members as she is a bit of a diva and perhaps a little vain, as demonstrated by her initial refusal to be seen without her expensive jewelry. Even so, Madame Fleury's positive traits far outweigh any minor flaws she may have. Heating up the next spot is Vivian. Out of all the party members in Thousand Year Door, Vivian has become a fan favorite due to her initial interpretation in the Japanese version of the game. While Vivian is portrayed as purely female in most English releases, her original interpretation portrayed her as transgendered. While we love Vivian, we do have to rank her at the lower end of the good category since we can't forget that she originally appeared as Mario's enemy. Vivian, along with her sisters Bedlam and Marilyn, were initially tasked with ambushing Mario in Bogley Woods. Once she's blamed unjustly for losing the super bomb, she switches to Mario's side after the plumber returns the weapon to her. This change in heart causes Vivian to help Mario when Duplass steals his identity, even fighting her sisters in the process. Vivian's character development is probably the most significant out of any party member, so we understand why fans praise this character so highly. Her initial actions likely stem from not being able to stick up to Bedlam and Marilyn in the first place, so while we can't defend her compliance, we don't hold it against her too much. Computing into the final spot is Tech XX. Upon being captured by the x knots Peach is held in their fortress where she is accompanied by Grotus' supercomputer, known as Tech for short. Resembling HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey, Tech has a unique reaction to Peach causing her to believe the computer is feeling love. Despite being loyal to Grotus, Tech does allow Peach to make the occasional email to Mario so long as she agrees to teach the computer what love is. While Tech does seem to genuinely care about Peach a lot, his loyalty to Grotus prevents him from dispelling certain information to her, such as her whereabouts or the x knots plans. This does cause conflict between Peach and Tech, although the computer gradually shifts away from assisting the x knots We understand this is all integral to Tech's arc of feeling emotions, but his initial refusal to dispel all information does cause a lot of obstacles for Peach and Mario. Vivian at least chose a side quickly once Mario helped her out. Also, Tech is initially helping out Peach so that he could be seen as the perfect computer, which isn't exactly the most selfish motivation. Regardless, we're glad Tech had 
a change of heart, er, programming, which is why this computer still lands in the good area. We've covered the good, so let's fold over to the gray area. These are the characters who could be deemed as good or bad depending on your perspective. Sniffing out the top of the gray area is Miss Mouse, an international thief. Mario initially meets Miss Mouse while she's hunting for treasure in Hooktail Castle. She makes a few reappearances afterward, eventually revealing herself as the owner of the lovely House of Badges shop in Rogueport. After the fourth chapter of the game, Miss Mouse sends out an optional request for Mario to help her locate a badge in Hooktail Castle. Miss Mouse eventually reveals this to be a test and joins Mario as the game's only optional party member upon finishing this quest. Miss Mouse's motivations for helping Mario are considerably less noble than the other members as she wants to use Mario to gather badges. Nevertheless, we think Miss Mouse secretly is less selfish than she likes to let on and wouldn't put herself in so many perilous circumstances without genuine respect and admiration for Mario's cause. We can't exactly call her pure at heart, but we think she has a sweet side underneath her mask. Searching around in the next spot is Pennington. A dim-witted penguin masquerading as a detective, Pennington takes Luigi under his wing as an apprentice, or at least, so he thinks. In reality, Pennington is interacting with Mario but doesn't realize it due to being a very poor detective. Pennington and Mario team up to solve mysteries on the train, with Mario doing all the work and Pennington taking all the credit. Pennington likes to refer to himself as the penguin with the improbably large brain, even though quite the opposite is true. We can't even say he's malicious and taking credit for Mario's work as Pennington really is stupid enough to believe he did it himself. His heart is possibly in the right place, but his brain is in another dimension, which is why we can't call him purely good or evil. Jumping in next is Luigi. While not exactly prominent in the game's story, Luigi does appear in Rogueport throughout Mario's adventure. Here, he explains to Mario that he's been having adventures in the Waffle Kingdom to save Princess Eclair from the evil King Chestnut. He tells Mario these stories in really drawn-out monologues which literally bore Mario to sleep. Many have criticized Mario for this, but we actually think Luigi is more at fault in these scenarios. Luigi continues moaning on even after Mario is unconscious, showing he's so caught up in his story that he doesn't even care if his brother is paying attention or not. It's also implied that Luigi is a pathological liar, as the partners who accompany him often claim he's fabricating certain events to make himself look good. We're also a bit confused as to how Luigi can be on this journey, but still find time to appear in the crowd to watch Mario's battles throughout the game. We commend Luigi for his noble efforts in rescuing Princess Eclair, but we're putting him closer to the gray category mostly due to his continued lying. Sailing in next is Flavio. An entrepreneur in Rogueport, Flavio is a brave, daring, explorer. At least, that's what he would want you to believe. Much like Luigi, we think Flavio is exaggerating this story more than a little bit. Flavio shows little to no nobility and likely is making his history up as he goes. Flavio is helpful to Mario and does show fairness when making a deal with Cortez, so we wouldn't call him evil or even bad really. His fabricated high opinion of himself does prevent us from calling him purely good though. Next up, we have Don Pianta. The head of a crime organization that rules the west side of Rogueport, Don Pianta agrees to help Mario on multiple occasions, so long as Mario will do something for him first. While this may sound sketchy, Don Pianta's tasks are pretty straightforward, requiring nothing more than to track down his missing daughter and his henchmen. Don Pianta seems threatening at first, but over the course of the game, he's revealed to be a family man who is suffering from extreme stress due to his demanding job. He even retires near the end of his story, passing on his business to his son-in-law. We respect him for caring so much about his daughter, although we have to remember that this is still a mob boss. His nickname, the Don of untimely death suggests this character may have some skeletons in his closet Mario doesn't know about. I guess what we don't know won't hurt us. Guarding the bottom of the gray area is Cortez. A revered pirate captain who lived over 1,000 years ago, Cortez was so obsessed with his treasure that his spirit stayed linked to it even after his death. When Mario arrives in Keel Hall Key, he eventually fights Cortez, but can't defeat him due to the spirit's immortality. When Cortez realizes Mario only wants the Sapphire Star, he hands it over to him, claiming to never have cared for it anyway. Cortez then surprisingly works with Mario in order to scare Lord Crump and the x knots off the island. Cortez seemingly has no ill intentions and wants to just spend eternity with his treasure, so as long as you don't interrupt him, he won't do you any harm. We still can't forget that he was a pirate who stole all of this treasure and stayed bound to it out of greed, which is why Cortez ranks closer to the bad category. Now that we've gone through the gray, let's end this story with the bad to evil. These are the most ruthless characters that Mario encountered on his adventure. Up next, we have Marilyn, a member of the Shadow Sirens who are loyal to the Shadow Queen, Marilyn, along with her sister's 
Vivian and Bedlam, is tasked with the mission of taking down Mario. While Vivian has a change of heart as the game progresses, Marilyn and Bedlam do not, and continually ambush the group on several occasions. The only reason we're ranking Marilyn somewhat low in the bad category is because she's far too stupid to really have any sort of ill intent. She barely speaks, and even when she does, it's usually a simple grunt. It's very clear that Bedlam is the brains of this operation, while Marilyn is the brawn, giving them a similar dynamic to classic cartoon thug characters like Rocky and Muggsy. Next up is Rockhawk, the championship winner of the Glitz Pit, albeit only by default since the previous champion disappeared. Rockhawk is an egotistical and competitive fighter who is pretty morally bankrupt when we first meet him. Once Mario threatens his title, Rockhawk even attempts to cheat to keep Mario from working his way up in the rankings. This includes mailing Mario a poison cake and locking him in his locker room so that Mario can't show up to battle. Due to his abhorrent actions, Mario and friends suspect Rockhawk of going after the Crystal Stars. This turns out to be a red herring, as Rockhawk was not even aware of the Crystal Stars' existence, but this doesn't absolve his behavior in the fights. Upon being defeated fair and square by Mario, Rockhawk gains a lot of respect for the plumber and vows never to cheat his way to victory ever again. As far as we can tell, he's stuck by his oath, becoming a much more respectable fighter in the Glitz Pit ring. Shapeshifting into our next spot is Duplus. Residing near the creepy steeple next to Twilight Town, Duplus gets enjoyment out of causing distress to the village's residents. He routinely turns them into pigs for the simple reason that he finds them depressing, boring, and dim-witted. Duplus is quite a trickster and even takes over Mario's body at one point, deceiving all of the other characters aside from Mario and Vivian. Upon his defeat, Duplus teams up with Bedlam and Marilyn to replace Vivian, mostly out of bitterness that Mario defeated him. Duplus is deceitful and enjoys getting a rise out of others, although we can't call him purely evil as his motivations aren't really any deeper than that. It's also explained that he helped helped out with Madame Fleury's stage show after the events of the game, so it's possible that he gave up on his mischievous ways. Body sliming into the next spot is Lord Crump. A general of the x knots Lord Crump is Lord Grotus's second-in-command who puts himself in the front lines to face Mario. Despite his unwavering loyalty to Grotus, Crump is pretty incompetent and often makes mistakes due to his low intelligence. Grotus himself is fully aware of Lord Crump's buffoonery, which makes us wonder how and why he was given the second-in-command position in the first place. Lord Crump faces Mario repeatedly throughout the game, sometimes by himself and sometimes while commanding a robot known as the Magnus von Grapple. After Grotus's defeat, Lord Crump, along with the rest of the x knots vowed to live in peace rather than stir up trouble. So at least he learned the error of his ways. Probably. Now we arrive at the final member of the Shadow Sirens we need to cover, that being Bedlam. As stated earlier, Bedlam is the brains of this operation and takes her leadership position very seriously. This causes Bedlam to be incredibly cruel and condescending toward Vivian, Marilyn, and eventually even Duplus whenever one of them steps out of line. On top of this, it's eventually revealed Vivian was the one who captured Princess Peach in Rogueport, thus sending the events of the entire game in motion. Bedlam is highly intelligent and manipulative, making her a very real threat even if her sisters are physically stronger. Bedlam does resolve to be a better sister to Vivian at the end of the game, so it is implied she does have a change of heart. We'd have to see further evidence of this change before we can take Bedlam out of the bad category, though. Next, we have a double ranking of Bowser and Kami Koopa. While not the main antagonists like they were in the first Paper Mario, Bowser and Kami Koopa do have a consistent presence throughout the Thousand Year Door, mostly in segments between the game's chapters. After finding out about the Crystal Stars, and that someone other than him captured Peach, Bowser heads off to Rogueport in an attempt to become the game's true villain. This leads to a myriad of different comedic relief moments where Bowser and Kami Koopa are amusingly one step behind Mario at every turn. Bowser and Kami do eventually catch up with Mario in the Thousand Year Door, where they are pretty quickly defeated and brushed aside so Mario can fight the Shadow Queen. Despite Bowser and Kami being uncharacteristically incompetent, they still have ill intent and receive no kind of reformation placing them firmly in the evil section. Flying on to the next spot are a collective ranking of Hooktail, Gloomtail, and Bonetail. Hooktail appears as the first major boss of the game, being the antagonist of the first chapter. Out of all the bosses in the game, it's quite possible that Hooktail has taken the most amount of lives, evident by the number of turtle skeletons lying around her castle. Upon defeating Hooktail, it's revealed that she also ate Koops' father, Koopley, who had been living in the dragon's belly for 10 years. While Hooktail does not reappear, Mario and friends do encounter her older brother, Gloomtail, who tries to take revenge on behalf of his sister's defeat. If the player navigates through the Pit of 100 Trials, they will find that Gloomtail and Hooktail have an even older brother named Bonetail, who is so old that he's lost both his skin and the ability to speak. These three dragons were apparently pets of the Shadow Queen at one point before striking it out on their own. Since all three dragons are pretty ruthless and have no sort of redemption arc, we have to say they rank among the most evil characters in the game. Grubba receives the Bronze Medal of Evil. 
The two-faced announcer who runs the Glitz Pit, Grubba on the surface is a very friendly individual who is a bit of a businessman, but seems to genuinely care about the well-being of his contestants. This is all a facade, though, as Grubba secretly is using a machine powered by a crystal star to transfer the energy of his fighters into his own body. When the Glitz Pit champion Prince Mush discovered this, Grubba captured him and stole his energy. Grubba eventually uses said harbored energy to transform into Macho Grubba, but loses it once again when defeated by Mario. Grubba is one of the few villains not a associated with the x or Shadow Queen, making him a mastermind in his own right. We're not exactly sure whatever became of Grubba, but regardless as to whether he was arrested or escaped, he is one of the most nefarious characters Mario meets on this adventure. The Silver Medal of Evil is awarded to Sir Grotus, the leader of the x -Nauts. Grotus is a tyrannical villain who will do anything he can to conquer the world. This includes kidnapping Princess Peach to use her as a vessel for the resurrection of the Shadow Queen. Almost all of the enemies in the game are working under Grotus's orders, making him the one ultimate responsible for most of their actions. While Grotus certainly is evil, he's not exactly the most cunning villain Mario has ever faced. He believes that the Shadow Queen will serve him due to resurrecting her. Much to his surprise, the Shadow Queen blasts Grotus with magic immediately upon her release, leaving only his disembodied corpse, which somehow is still alive. Even though the x nauts apparently changed their ways at the end of the game, we're not letting Grotus off the hook, as we're positive he'd still be striving for world conquest if he still had his body. The Gold Medal of Evil is going to, say it with us now, the Shadow Queen. This decision wasn't exactly a hard choice given how dark and destructive this being truly is. The Shadow Queen is a demonic figure who is attempting to build up an evil army comprised of dragons and sirens to take over the world. Once she was defeated, her soul was locked away in the Thousand Year Door for over a millennium, awaiting her opportunity to break free and continue her mission. Had the Shadow Queen been successful in this endeavor, the entire world would claim servitude to her as she spread her darkness across the entire globe. Not only is the Shadow Queen getting the gold in this game, but she's arguably one of the most immoral beings Mario has ever fought in his entire life. Once Mario uses the power of the Crystal Stars and his allies, he's able to definitively beat the Shadow Queen once and for all. This makes her one of, if not the only enemy in the Thousand Year Door, to actually meet her demise at the hands of Mario. We can't say it happened to a more deserving character, which is why the Shadow Queen easily nabs the Gold Medal of Evil. With our morality spectrum complete, let's wrap things up by awarding some Sinner Medals. The Green Medal easily goes to Cortez. This was a no-brainer, considering Cortez's soul is forever bound to the treasure that he stole. The Pride Medal is awarded to Rockhawk. This fighter was so caught up in his own glory that he resorted to cheating, all so he can maintain his position as the Glitz Pit Champion. The Darwin Medal has to go to Lord Crump. We know we brought this up before, but we can't get over why Grotus would assign such a high-ranking position to this bumbling idiot. The Sloth Medal is going to Bowser and Kami Koopa. The running joke of these two being far too slow to catch up to Mario is a constant source of comedy throughout the story. We're also giving Bowser the Envy Medal, as his presence in the game is partially due to jealousy over someone other than him capturing Princess Peach. The Wrath Medal is awarded to the Shadow Queen. Being stuck in a tomb for over 1,000 years certainly turned this already destructive demon into an even more bitter entity. The Lust Medal is going to Miss Mouse. This femme fatale rodent often flirts with Mario throughout the game, implying there might be another reason she helps him beyond searching for treasure. But let us know in the comment section who you think the most evil character is from Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. And if you need a 1-up, make sure to hit that notification bell and binge our other good to evil videos. Thanks for watching.